Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Hi there. By now, you've probably heard me talk about my new book, Love Every Day. It will be out in the world in October, but you can pre-order it any time before then. And let me tell you a little something. Pre-ordering is one of the best ways you can support authors and their new books. Why? More pre-orders equals more buzz about the book, and more buzz means reaching even more readers. Because of this, I really want to thank anyone who has already pre-ordered or who will pre-order Love Every Day by offering them two free gifts. You can sign up to receive these goodies by heading to the link in the show notes of this episode or by visiting loveeverydaybook.com. You're going to fill out a quick little form with your proof of a pre-order purchase, like a screenshot of your e-receipt, plus your mailing address and your email. And then you will receive a complimentary Love Everyday journal in the mail. It's so beautiful. And a digital reader's guide in your email inbox. Both of these will arrive in mid-October, right when you're receiving your Love Every Day book. The journal is going to be the perfect place for you to jot down your thoughts and reflections as you read, and the digital reader's guide is full of discussion questions that you can use to spark solo reflection or to spur conversation in a book club, for example. Plus, the reader's guide includes the Love Every Day playlist with some of my favorite songs that celebrate growth, healing, and connection. To learn more about this offering, click the link in the show notes or head to loveeverydaybook.com. If you have questions about the pre-order gifts, email info at dralexandrasolomon.com for support from our team. Thank you so much. Welcome to this week's episode of Reimagining Love. I am glad that you're joining me today because I'm sharing with you a conversation that is rich, challenging, and important. I'm joined by Jessica Fern and David Cooley, who are life partners, co-parents, and co-authors of the new book, Polywise, A Deeper Dive into Navigating Open Relationships. Jessica Fern is a psychotherapist, coach, and certified clinical trauma professional. In addition to this new book, She's the author of Polysecure, Attachment, Trauma, and Non-Monogamy, and the Polysecure Workbook, Healing Your Attachment and Creating Security in Loving Relationships. In her international private practice, Jessica works with individuals, couples, and people in multi-partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas, helping them to embody new possibilities in life and love. David Cooley is a professional restorative justice facilitator, a diversity and privilege awareness trainer, and a bilingual cultural broker. He's the creator of the Restorative Relationship Conversations Model which is a process that transforms interpersonal conflict into deeper connection, intimacy, and repair. In his private practice, David specializes in working with non-monogamous and LGBTQ partnerships, incorporating a variety of modalities, including trauma-informed care, attachment theory, somatic practices, narrative therapy, and mindfulness-based techniques. In this conversation, we discuss Jessica and David's relationship journey and their guidance for individuals and couples who are looking to create relationship agreements beyond monogamy. 
we also explore a question from a listener in Brazil who's wanting to support his girlfriend's desire to explore her sexuality outside of their relationship. Whether you are happily and comfortably practicing sexual monogamy, happily and comfortably practicing ethical non-monogamy, or curious about potentially opening your relationship up, I know that you are going to learn something important in this conversation that's going to help you love with greater care and awareness. Enjoy. Jessica and David, I am so excited to have the two of you here, and I have got the questions stacked up for you both. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's good to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. So the way that I usually start episodes of Reimagining Love is with the relational self-awareness question. And I would love to ask that question of both of you. Are you ready for the question? So ready. We're ready. Okay. So I would like to know from each of you, what is a growing edge that you're working on in one of your important relationships? And what has it been teaching you lately? So I'll go first. And I actually just had a conversation literally yesterday with uh, my primary partner about sort of a place that I get to when I'm really struggling with my physical aspect of life. Um, I have some significant health issues. I have a long-term chronic uh, autoimmune condition. And so it'll flare up in kind of, and sometimes it's it's hard to know what's causing the flare-ups and it can last for days. And so once I get kind of past the third, fourth day I'll start to have a pretty intense psychological dip that can also bring up feelings of not wanting to be alive, you know, so it's, it's not necessarily a suicidal impulse, but it's definitely, there's a part of me that's tired of it. You know, it's been over 25 years that I've been dealing with this. And so there's just sort of a a fatigue, existential fatigue. And so I noticed this, this relationship is we just celebrated our first year anniversary, which is super exciting. And I noticed in leaving messages recently that I was not naming this part, this sort of of me that starts to feel suicidal. You know, it's a very dark and difficult place to be in. Again, it's not that I want to die, but it's, I don't want to be in pain at this level. So I noticed that I was not saying it um, and kind of talking about other things in messages that I was leaving to her until we were together and. Um, I was kind of having some tenderness in our transition because we don't live together. So I was at her place getting ready to leave, feeling this tenderness come up and then just realizing, wow, I'm not naming this thing and I can feel fear around naming it because I'm afraid of you feeling like it's too much to be with someone who's kind of holding this kind of thing. So what it's teaching me is, you know, sort of the places where I have to go around security you know, an intimacy when it comes to revealing my own um, struggles with with my condition, you know, what that means about my perception of the security of the relationship. Like, can the relationship, is it strong enough to hold all of me, even when it's this, this painful? Wow, David, you are really, I mean, you're letting us in, uh, you know, in this conversation, letting us into something really important about you and, um, and it parallels like what you, what you were wrestling with in terms of how do you share something as tender and vulnerable as that in a relationship without sort of putting it at your partner's feet and putting it as a burden? Cause I hear, as you're describing it, I hear, well, what I think you're saying is that you wanted, you wanted to share this as a window into your struggle rather than as something that is then her responsibility to take care of or manage. Do I have that right? Absolutely. And I think that's part of it. I think you, you hit the nail on the head is that's part of the fear is that there's going to be sort of this feeling of now she has to caretake or, you know, that, that somehow it's something that I'm asking her to hold or fix or manage as opposed to just hear and be with me in it. Right. Well, and there are a few topics that spike our fear, urgency, panic, action orientation, then suicide, right? Like suicidal ideation is something that really does activate, you know, all of us and it it can't not, and it ought to activate us, right? And it is something that's really difficult for us to talk about is when somebody, and, and it's, 
you know, this is a, oh my gosh, this is like a whole nother, like have you back on the show and unpack this one, but like sort of what it is to live with those big existential questions about life in a culture that is terrified of talking about life and death and choice and all of that. So I, I hear that for you, you know your cycle. You know that when your body hurts, one of the places you go is a craving of relief of some kind. And so you know this about yourself. And I imagine that is what helps you not panic and just kind of create the space inside of you to hold it, witness it, be gentle with it. Absolutely. You know, and it's wanting to share it in a way that it doesn't become a burden, but it becomes sort of a point of connection, right? And, and intimacy. And so it's an interesting question of when do we start to reveal things this existentially delicate to partners? And so for me, it's a real interesting question around when is a relationship secure enough emotionally to share these things with partners? Yep. And it's your own work too your own relationship with your illness and your psychological cycles and where you go, your own relationship, because then you're able to offer it with that bigger context. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's such a, such an important offering. Thank you, David. Yeah. Thanks for the question. All right. Jessica, how about for you? What's a, what's a growing edge for you or whatever you want to respond to it to David and then pick up where you want to pick up. (laughs) Well, him and I have talked about this a bunch as well. But for me, a growing edge right now in my relationship is allowing myself to want more. This is really edgy for me. I was a child of neglect. So there's really that shutting down, that self-reliance, and then that shutting down of needs and wants. So the allowing of more needs and wants is, it's risky, it's vulnerable, it's edgy. And then there's been an adult pattern where usually I'm the overfunctioner in the partnership as well. So really being trying to be in a more balanced dynamic, but still allow myself to, whether it's just want more time or whatever it is, just want more. And also be grateful for what I also do have. So there's this interesting back and forth there, right? Like really soaking in and savoring and appreciating what I'm getting. And then also wanting it to expand. Yeah. Do you think it's fair to say as you sit with wanting more that when you do that, you are creating new possibilities for connection in your current relationship, as well as offering healing to little Jessica, like the little girl who experienced neglect? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's expanding the possibilities in the current relationship. And then it is, I'm doing inner parts and inner child work with the parts of me that are afraid to want more, you know, feel like it's too risky to allow myself to want that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I know that that is such, such a growing edge for so many listeners to the show and so many of us is how do we give ourselves permission to ask for more, even as we savor what we have, that wanting more does not necessarily need to reflect an absence of, but rather like an expansion of, expansion of and building upon what is there. Thank you both for sharing your growing edges with us. But I, so before we dive into our topic of the day, which is consensual non-monogamy and how to create rich, strong, thriving relationships that are open, I would love for the two of you to kind of give us the context. Who are each of you and what is your relationship to each other? You are, I know that you are co-authors of this wonderful brand new book, Polywise. Tell us a bit more about kind of like put us in, put, put the two of you in context, please, as we dive in. So Jessica and I met about 20, almost 21 years ago in a residential massage school in Northern California. And there was a lot of chemistry at first. We were both East Coasters, newly arrived to Northern California. And so there was a lot of culture shock for us. And so East Coasters kind of flocked together for safety and consolation. And in that little group, we found each other and there was a sort of an initial interest And we ended up taking a really profound three-hour and some change walk around the property of this beautiful area up in the the mountains and really just unpacked our entire lives, our philosophy of the world. And it was just amazing. There was so much resonance, uh, so much alignment, personal values, uh, so much humor. It was just a lot of simpatico and synchronicity. And so we kind of started a little romance that lasted a few weeks. And then I got cold feet pretty quick. Probably was having attachment issues now that I look back at it and wasn't aware of it. 
So we downshifted to friends, which was kind of a challenging transition, but we did it well, I think, and then stayed really good friends in the time that we remained at that school. Jessica left and went to Colorado to pursue her massage career. I stayed and worked in the kitchen for a while and then went on to become a chef. And sort of every six months or so, we would get together, you know, and be in the same space, visit wherever we happen to be in the world. And there's always kind of this question in the background, is, is there chemistry? Is that spark that was there sort of more than just friendship? And then situationally, things would happen. She'd be with somebody or I would. We'd just be in a place where we weren't open to it for whatever reason. But that connection always felt strong. And we were always nurturing each other as friends through the relationships we were in. And then about I would say once I was kind of on the verge of turning 30, started to have this revelation of wanting a really committed and solid relationship, long-term relationship, which I had never really had up to that point. And so this circuit was coming online for me. And I realized that I was holding up potential partners to this standard mentally that I had, which was Jessica. And I would say to myself after disappointment, so, oh, but they're not Jessica. Why am I getting something when I, you know, that doesn't live up to this thing that I already hold as the gold, the gold standard. And so reached out to Jessica in, in kind of a, a fever of excitement and, and clarity, like, hey, why don't we really try us? And she quickly said, okay, prove it. Prove that you're really here for this and that this is a real thing for you and not sort of just more of a, a momentary impulse. And so I did and we got together and after about eight months of living together, um, we got married and we were married for about seven or eight years and then had our son together and then opened our relationship, you know, a few years after our son was born, went through that adventure and then got divorced um, a few years after opening. And then there was some space where we were just kind of very purely co-parents living in different parts of the same town, um, and then kind of had a, a renewal of our connection as friends, which started to deepen again. Then we moved to, in the pandemic, we were looking for solutions for our living situation and our son's education, moved down to Costa Rica together with her then husband. So we were all living together for a little while, um, which really sort of opened up a new possibility for intimacy between us in a, in a new way, not um, romantically or sexually, but just kind of as friends again. And then we moved back to the States and bought property and, and moved into the same house and are currently living outside of Asheville, North Carolina together um, with our son. Jessica, anything you would add or highlight to the story? Yeah, just I think I like to celebrate that we really have embodied relationship fluidity. You know, that our relationship has taken many iterations and there's been this really pure, beautiful bond that's kept us together um, in the ways that work. That's always been a part of our dialogue, like what's working and let's keep that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And not, and just cause yeah, maybe our romance isn't working. That doesn't mean we have to let go of each other as humans. Cause there's so many things that currently work so well and co-parenting, nesting partners, and now, you know, co-authors of a huge creative project. So. so wait, just to clarify, so is your, so who is in your home? It's the two of you, your son. Yes. Right now it's the three of us, right? Two of us and our son. And then we each have partners that live outside of the house. Wonderful. It really is, Jessica. I, I, yeah, that, that really like in the story, I mean, every romance, every love story has chapters and your, the chapters of your love story really do. I mean, the theme that runs through is that the two of you I hear have worked again and again to figure out what works and to have the form of the relationship kind of align with the function. Who are we to each other? Who do we want to be to each other? What do we need from each other? And then what structure or agreement will serve that best. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think the term that, I don't know if we've coined it, but we definitely like the uh, the concept of life partners. Yeah, we definitely didn't coin mm -hmm. that term. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, that that's, but that that's really what you are. You are life partners. Right now, the form that your relationship is taking really serves what each of you are needing and wanting and what your son is is needing. And all. I love that. That's really, a, you're, you are walking the talk. Okay, so... 
We have not yet done, we've not done a lot on reimagining love around consensual non-monogamy, around polyamory, around relationships that exist outside of the traditional monogamous structure. So I would love for us to start kind of with some foundational terminology. Let's talk about the language that we're going to, that we use in this conversation. So what is consensual non-monogamy and and why do you tend to use the term polyamory? Like what are, where do you want to be around language? So consensual non-monogamy, or it's also called ethical non-monogamy, that would be the broader umbrella term for people that are not cheating, but they have multiple partners and that could be sexual and or romantic. And everyone knows everyone's consenting and as best as they can being ethical about being in multiple sexual romantic partnerships or relationships. So that's the big umbrella term. And then underneath that, there's lots of different styles of non-monogamy. So polyamory, which we'll also use, and it will probably wind up using it as a synonym, but it's not always, you know, polyamory is when You have multiple partnerships, people that you're in love with, creating sort of even attachment-based sort of relationships with more than one person. Whereas a phrase like open marriage might be a couple who has more um, casual or occasional sexual experiences outside of their marriage. And there's many other terms we can throw in there too, but that's, I think, a good start. It is a good, it's a good start. It's a good start. And what it really highlights is that when we enter this whole kind of portal of expansiveness around sexual boundaries, we really are kind of teasing apart sexual connection, romantic connection, attachment, all of those come into question, which is why I treasure so much this conversation of whether somebody, no matter where somebody decides to put their boundaries or their agreements, by having this conversation, what we're doing is becoming really intentional and conscious about the why, about the function, about the risks and benefits of any place where we want to put the boundary rather than just what we've done for years and generations, which is just assume monogamy and assume everyone knows what everyone means when we say monogamy. So there's something so rich about the ways in which this you know, we've begun to tease apart and become intentional about uh, why are we putting the boundaries where we're putting them. Okay. And then is polyamory an identity or a behavior and a preference? In other words, is it an orientation or is it a lifestyle? It's a full spectrum of possibilities, you know, and and so it can be absolutely both. If we look at both of those concepts, lifestyle and orientation or identity, I'll use identity and orientation as kind of synonymous. There's a whole gamut of possibilities. And I think some people would see themselves along that spectrum at different times in their lives. And so it's not even that one person is that thing inherently or fundamentally through and through, but can actually change and grow in either direction. And then there are people who do squarely identify it kind of closer to the ends, you know, one versus the other. Um, There's also a concept that I really like of ambiamory you know, which is both. And some in some places, they really relate to and gravitate or feel in alignment with monogamy. And in other moments in their lives, uh, non-monogamy, some form of non-monogamy. And so it's really very flexible in terms of what the possibilities are. It's like, I'm imagining an arrow that goes in both directions between what I call relational self-awareness, sort of understanding who you are and how that leads to making choices around the relationship architecture that's going to work for you and that the relational architecture you choose continues to grow your relational self-awareness, right? That that arrow goes in both directions. Absolutely. I mean, ideally for me, yes, you know, is that it's a, it's an invitation to consider sort of more flexibility or sort of openness to what happens as you continue to deepen relationships with people, what changes in you. So it's kind of an invitation to be more open to change in general, relationally. Jessica, what do you think that the shame and stigma that we have kind of collectively about consensual non-monogamy, what does that shame and stigma tell us about the cultural beliefs we carry about intimate partnerships? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, It tells us we still have a ways to go, I think. (laughs) Because it's so confusing, right? Because when we look statistically, the maj- 
almost sometimes, depending on the study, sometimes 50% of people admit to cheating (laughs) in their monogamous relationships, right? So we have that in practice, most people or many people are not actually practicing monogamy, even if they say they're monogamous, right? And yet we can't, we're not revealing our erotic desires, sexual desires, romantic desires, right? Attractions, preferences, all of those things. It's not just the stigma on multiple partners. It's also sort of where we need to grow around sex positivity, body positivity, you know, allowing the fullness of ourselves as humans and, you know, reimagining love, right? (laughs) It's pretty fascinating, isn't it, that we have resistance to the idea of opening up relationships, even as, you know, I mean, at, at any given moment, I don't know, half to three quarters of my caseload of couples are couples who are in recovery from infidelity. And not that, I mean, I don't, I don't know that infidelity means that somebody ought to be in an open relationship, but it certainly means, right, that infidelity is a symptom that there is something going on, as you're saying, around how the couple is managing their erotic life, managing sex positivity, all of that, right? So it it is certainly a symptom. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier, Alexandra, about sort of the ways in which there's a, a tendency to lean too heavily into the structure of a relationship for a sense of safety and security uh, or fulfillment. And so I think the impulse to explore something like consensual non-monogamy is really an invitation to see what's what's beneath that, like or beyond that. Like what, if we're not relying on the structure of the relationship, i.e. a monogamous structure that's fixed um, to the degree that it is generally in our culture, then really what's the glue of the relationship? What's the what's the bond really about, right? And that's where I think the question really becomes juicy and potent. Oof, it sure is. I've seen the two of you argue that, I know that the two of you argue that monogamy is oftentimes used as a stand-in for security. It's like, if we are monogamous, we are safe. And what you're challenging us to do is imagine a kind of security that is anchored more deeply than just the framework. Right. And you can still be exclusive, right? We're pro-exclusivity as well. Um, But just looking at, you know, am I getting my secure attachment from my actual relational experience or just from the structure that I'm in? Okay. So keep unpacking that for us because what you're saying is you can't, you may end up Are you saying that a couple may end up choosing sexual exclusivity, but by considering why and how and what the risks are and what the benefits are, they're going to end up with something that's anchored more deeply than just like stamp the relationship with a big monogamy label and phew, we're done, we're safe, we're secure. Exactly. And I think, you know, if we take a case like, let's uh, imagine, in this case, a heterosexual couple where sort of the man is is not emotionally attuned to his monogamous partner, female partner, in part because he's been socialized not to do that, but they're in a monogamous relationship. And so there's the assumption that you're just going to stay in that relationship, whether or not that need gets met. And so the relationship structure keeps people together often. Not always, and there's the divorce rates to prove it. But I think when people do feel sort of committed to the structure, i.e. the marriage, the monogamous marriage, there's a way in which people can sort of perpetuate living without getting certain needs met. So in this particular example, say the female or the woman is really feeling a lack or absence of deep emotional attunement, wanting that to change, but there's no sort of in that ecosystem of that relationship, there's no impetus for that change to happen. And so if you take away that structure, then the question becomes, what's keeping us together? And so what are you relying on? And that impetus then is there for the man to really answer that question. Like, why should the wife stay in a context like that where she's not getting this really important need met? And so it sort of challenges us to to really think, okay, are these deeper needs? And that's when I say a deeper level, it's really about the needs and wants of, of every individual in a relationship. Are those getting attended to? Are those getting met? Can that even be talked about? 
So where my mind goes with that, David, is like, it just goes to the entire initial function of the institution of marriage, right? Like, so now we're talking about patriarchy and white body supremacy and heteronormativity. And, you know, so it does, I remember, I'll never forget what it felt like when I first at um family, couple and family therapy conference, I sat in on a session about consensual non-monogamy. And, you know, as somebody who trained whatever, 20 plus years ago, this was not even in, right? I mean, the field is called marriage and family therapy, couple and family. I mean, monogamy is not even typically up for discussion or debate. And so sitting in, it was edgy for this family therapy conference, you know, five or seven years ago to even have a session on non-monogamy. And I remember what it felt like in my body to sit in that session. It was like I felt the ground moving underneath me. It felt like quicksand. It felt like like an unraveling. And I think that's I think that's really frightening, but I think it highlights, I think when we have that feeling, it highlights kind of how the fragility upon which a lot of this stuff is built, you know, and these bigger questions about, okay, so wait, why? Why does marriage look the way that it looks? And why? So how do individuals start to open up these questions without scaring the crap out of themselves and unraveling themselves so quickly that it feels like, wait a minute, where do I even, like, where is solid ground, you know? I mean, what's your, is your ideal scenario that a couple talks about this early on? Because I know oftentimes it happens, right, months and years and decades down the road. So if you could whisper in a young, you know, in sort of a newish couple's ear, if you could whisper in their ear, what would you want them to be thinking about and talking about early on? Right. Yeah. If we could create an ideal situation where we have a couple, it would be that even in the beginning, they're actually negotiating that they are being exclusive instead of assuming it. And they're talking about why they want to be exclusive right now what it means to them, what benefit they think it offers each other and the relationship, right? And then, but also that exclusivity doesn't mean owning each other's sexuality, right? Like allowing there to be space too, that of course we're probably going to be attracted to other people, but that's different than acting on our attraction for other people, right? That was an agreement actually Dave and I had in the beginning, and it fostered a lot of trust for me even in monogamy of going, yeah, of course, we're going to find other people attractive, but we'll bring it to each other first. We won't start engaging in that sort of energetic or emotional or physical exchange with someone else. But then, yeah, people talking about their any desires they have or hopes that they would have to be non-monogamous. And as we say again and again, you know, to take it slow right? To talk about why they want non-monogamy, what they think it would look like. And you can do a lot of prep work, coming up with agreements, working on secure attachment together, right? You know, phasing into certain things that you're doing in terms of non-monogamy instead of just everything all at once, right? And these things help. They really do. Um, having good, you know, emotional differentiation from each other with secure attachment, like that's going to set you up for success. And yet the ground is still going to shake under you. <laughs> it's still, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. still a whole world of new experiences. That's like, you can't know until you're in it, you know? I really like that you're inviting people to remember that like the preparation matters and the practices are also like the, where you start, where you continue to gather data, right? You can say, here's what we want, here's how it should be. And then it's like, oh, and now we're doing it. And now we have to refine or revise or come back together and keep talking about it. Right. I'd say it's the same thing having a child, right? You do all this prep and you get all this stuff and you set up the spaces and and then it's it's completely different once there's an actual child in your arms, right? Or Or like, for me, college didn't prepare me for actual work. (laughs) Like it was very different, right? Like the educations I received were great, but they didn't actually, it was so different to actually be on the job. Yeah. The only difference I would say in terms of that metaphor of having a kid is that sort of, if you have a kid, there's no going back. The kid's there and that's never going to change. Whereas I think when you're looking at something like exploring consensual non-monogamy, you can go back, you can stop, you can close up again, you can create exclusivity. And it's important to know that going in that you all have the power to determine your trajectory as a relationship. And so seeing it as an exploration, seeing as something that you're going to try, take a step, have an experience, and then come back. 
right? And so almost like creating in the way that infants create attachment, right? You go out from the relationship, you come back to it and really sort of anchor and integrate the experiences that you do have. How did that feel? How are you doing now with that? What needs to change in relationship to, to the new experience? Whereas with a kid, you don't, that's not a luxury that you really have. It's just you're in that now and that's your new reality. So I think it's important for, especially for people making the transition to remember you have a lot more control and agency than potentially you think you do. I agree. And I want to add that for some people, once they open up, there is no going back because it feel it is their orientation. They finally feel like they're getting to be who they are. And for their partner who might not feel that strongly about it or like it's an orientation for them, that can be really scary because they want that sort of uh, parachute to say, you know, but we can just go back if we want. Right. And yet I know many people that once they open to them, it is only, you know, forward, not back. Yeah. Which is, you know, that, that difference sort of loving across that difference of, I don't know, I'll try it and see versus, oh my gosh, this is really who I am. That's a difference that can be really frightening, but it's not that risk of kind of growth leading to something that that puts bigger relationship viability questions on the table. That's not just about opening up a relationship. That happens every time somebody, whatever, expands in any kind of a way, right? Any kind of new step or new adventure puts a couple at risk. And so I think that, that this one, for sure, I don't want to minimize that opening up you know, is, is for sure a risk, but it certainly isn't the only risk that a couple, you know, would take. I mean, that's interesting to think about in the context even of our monogamous uh, marriage. I mean, we were very explicit actually about that possibility of someday the structure of marriage may not serve us. And that was kind of a safety mechanism for me to sort of be able to step into the commitment of marriage was to be able to have a conversation that would allow for the possibility for us to change and evolve past the structure. And so I think you're right that, yeah, it's, it's not about necessarily having sort of, we're committed to this now forever, and this is the new choice for us forever, but that, yeah, every choice relationally does imply the potential for us to grow beyond the structure that we create or the relationship itself. Yeah. Okay, so I've heard you say that common advice in the in the poly world is don't use poly to fix your relationship. <laughs> so if somebody is choosing to open up as an attempt to address some relationship problem, why won't why won't that work? Yeah, I think in some cases it can, some cases it can't. It really depends on the situation. I think if you're talking about a relationship where there's really fundamental needs not being met, um, like attachment needs, you know, basic emotional attunement, communication that's not completely riddled with contentious patterns, sort of an adversarial posture that's chronic in the relationship. In a situation like that where people are really struggling in a way that you would look at a monogamous relationship and say, whoa, those are a lot of problems there. Non-monogamy is just going to accentuate and blow those things up. It's going to make those things come front and center, be completely exposed, and everything's going to get more complex faster. And so if you don't have sort of a solid ground to stand on in terms of your your capacity to deal with conflict well, to manage ups and downs, you know, essentially have a secure attachment, non-monogamy is not going to give that to you. That's just going to make everything that's already hard worse. Yeah. But I do think sometimes non-monogamy is a solution for partners. And and we see that as well, right? Um, Partners who do enjoy each other, they love each other, they have family, they have decades together, maybe they have work together, but their romantic or sexual connection isn't fulfilling for them. And instead of saying, well, I have to get those needs met from you, otherwise I never get them met, you know, those type of relationships opening up can work really well, you know, or sometimes there's relationships where it's like, there's just one specific need that just, you know, isn't getting met here and outsourcing is a great solution. It all comes back to attachment and the quality of connection. If a couple has worked to establish a secure connection and they've got that foundation, then opening up is likely to, it's, it's like opening up then, as you were saying before, 
opening up and that sort of trial and error and stepping out into the world and coming back home and talking about it, like that can create even more security in the attachment. But for a couple who's saying, we aren't happy, we aren't connected, we're conflictual, we are not emotionally attuned to each other, let's open up. So that's, it's most likely that that's going to, opening up is going to just highlight and amplify all of the ways in which they are misunderstanding and feeling misunderstood. Yeah. And it can be that you do have a relatively secure base and that you've got some skills and some self-awareness as, a, as individuals and partners. And you still go through really intense things. It still brings, you know, the transition to CNM can still rock your world and shake the, the tectonic plates beneath your feet. And you can go through really intense attachment ruptures as well. I mean, that's our story is an example of that. I'm glad that you are sharing that and normalizing that. That doesn't mean some, that you can be securely attached and still be rocked by this transition. Yeah, because it's a, cause it's a different paradigm of relating. So you are securely functioning within one paradigm and it doesn't always fully translate to secure functioning in a completely different paradigm, right? Like sort of like changing currencies or, you know, changing languages, right? There's not always the same equivalent. You could have been a great, secure, healthy, happy couple in non-monogamy. And if you're struggling in non-monogamy, it doesn't mean you weren't a happy, secure couple in monogamy, right? It doesn't negate that. It just means, yeah, you're in this huge paradigm shift that could be hard for anybody, right? Right. And to further normalize that is for people that have been consensually non-monogamous for years go through transitions in, within it and can have massive ruptures, right? So you could have someone that's really seasoned in terms of living and even identifying themselves as I am polyamorous or I am non-monogamous by nature, and they can still have those kinds of experiences within their transitions into different configurations or arrangements. And those challenges that individuals and couples experience are both the emotional challenges that are in, inherent to any relationship, as well as I imagine the absence of larger social support, right? I imagine that part of what makes it challenging is how do we talk to our friends and family about this transition we're making? How do we share our experiences when the choices, when this choice is still, you know, somewhat misunderstood and stigmatized? So I imagine it's like that kind of both and of it's hard because it's hard and it's hard because there's quite a bit of wind at a couple's face. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think non-monogamous folks can be really wonderful at finding and creating non-monogamous communities, right? There's a lot of these rich, really connected communities of people practicing non-monogamy and they're not necessarily out dating each other, but just, you know, shared paradigm, shared values is really important. And resources like your books, there's a need for relationship education for all of us, but to have support in multiple forms and resources is essential. Okay. Can we tackle a listener question together, please? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. All right. I would like to have the two of you talk us through a listener question from Louise, and he is writing in from Brazil and he uses he, him pronouns. And he writes, our two-year relationship is very loving, but over time she lost her desire in me. And now she says she's feeling attracted to women. She doesn't know if it's sexual or just admiration, but it's an irrepressible desire. In my view, this lack of desire stems from her lack of effort on the relationship. She's very busy and relationships aren't a priority for her and an excess of presence and security on my end. I'm always there when she needs me and I have empathetically put up with a lot of asymmetry for the sake of our progressive growth as partners. I don't doubt she may be interested in women, but I do believe there are ways to cope with that and rekindle our desire. Initially, for me, an open relationship or threesomes was out of the question. I love monogamy. But if it's a way for her to safely explore and possibly come back if she finds that it's not for her, I'd be willing to give it a go and look for partners myself. My priority is keeping and growing the relationship we built, imperfect though it may be. How can we overcome this together? Oh, there's a lot packed into this question. I would love for either of you to pick up where you, you know, where your interest goes. Yeah, I'll start and then Dave, you can, you can finish it. But initially what jumps out is what's with this imbalance? 
right? Luis is admitting to an imbalanced dynamic where he's even saying that she's not interested in relationships. And yet here he sounds like this very available, over-functioning partner. So I really want to look at, you know, he's doing a lot about talking about her. I want to hear more about like, why are you in a dynamic where you're kind of so available, so empathetic, so loving, and potentially not getting that reciprocation in this relationship, right? And I think he's making this connection that it's sort of that kind of dynamic is what he's thinking is the cause of this sexual attraction or the decrease in sexuality. So what other dynamics are going on there? right? I want to explore. And then, yes, she might have an attraction to women being bisexual. She might identify as lesbian or something in between. And so when that occurs in someone's life, it's really important that they get to explore it. And so it's hard because she probably personally needs to have the experience of figuring that out. And it is uncertain where that will end up if she wants to be with both men and women, or if she just wants to be with women. And so can he hang in there with her to let her explore and figure out her own sexual orientation, which puts the relationship at risk? Yeah. So I'd want them to figure out, is it a period where she gets to just explore that and he's not necessarily dating yet, right? Because that would destabilize the relationship in a different direction. Or do they both want to open up and see what happens? I'm also super curious about what this other partner, what the the female's partner experience really is. When he's he's naming sort of loss of desire for him, I want to know, is is she corroborating that? Is that actually her experience? And a lot of times, and this is a generalization, but I see it a lot in my work, is that when when women feel a lack of intellectual or emotional attunement, they lose desire sexual desire. And so I'd really want to explore, are there needs that she's having in the relationship with Luis that aren't getting met, that potentially aren't being named? Is there a way that that can be explored? If she's explicitly saying, no, I've just lost desire and I need to go explore this other thing in order to know, then that's valid. And the space is held for that. But when partners speak in a way like Jessica's naming this much about what the other partner's not doing and what sort of where they're not showing up, I get really suspicious. I'm so glad that you both are drawing our attention to that element for Luis is that he's, it's, it's part of, I imagine, it's a double-edged sword where I imagine it's part of what makes him a really wonderful partner is that he really, really wants to understand her experience and what's going on for her. And, okay, I would we, we would of course want to be looking at the family system that Luis grew up in, right? What are the way, you know, is this, was that an early adaptation? When he was little, was he expected to be, you know, kind of over-functioning for parents? And so he's brought that into, because it just, it sounds like it's just sort of the air that he breathes as he's really focusing on what she's doing, what she's not doing, what she's needing. Yeah, and there's one thing too that's really important to be careful about. And I think this is something that happened in in sort of monogamous paradigm is when a partner starts to express desire, non-monogamous desires, it's very easy to pathologize that. And so even looking at that question of losing desire, quote unquote, in Luis is sort of saying, well, she's not interested in relationships. There's something, this isn't working because there's some defect or fault happening on that side, or there's something wrong with me. And so there's a way in which sort of monogamy encourages a subtle pathologization of any kind of inclination or desire to explore non-monogamy. And so I'd really want to sort of level the playing field in terms of the projection of kind of moral superiority or sort of inherent pathology of that inclination. Like to look outside of this relationship means there's something wrong with me or you. And that's something that I would want to really be explicit as well. That's great. That's great. And it, it, it ties to what Jessica was saying about, you know, there's, there's the question here is multifaceted because there's a sex, there's a sexuality question, right? Is what is going on with her desire towards women? That's almost like is stand separate and apart from the question about opening up. They're, they're bound together because she's currently in a monogamous partnership with a man. She has to, they have to tease apart the sexual orientation question 
and the relationship structure question. That was something, Jessica, that you were really highlighting is that the thing that the thing we know for sure is that she's experiencing attraction to women and you really want there to be permission to explore that. And that may mean that that means opening up the relationship, but does that mean opening up the relationship for a time? And what you're saying is if they open up, if Luis opens up and she opens up, that's a different kind of situation versus some some sort of agreement where she explores in order to get more data around this question about her attractions. Exactly. Yeah. It's complicated, but it's, <laughs> it's complicated, but it's important. And, and what I love is that I hear that Luis is interested in really trying to, trying to find paths forward. Right. I hear his commitment to being with her to figure this out. I would want them to have a couple's therapist, of course, with them in this conversation. Other thoughts about how you'd want them to be resourcing themselves as they continue to wrestle with this? I think reading Jessica's book, you know, on attachment is a really good idea, you know, poly secure. And then if that, you know, feels palatable and digestible and helpful, then then move on to something like poly wise. And then there's sort of a gamut of considerations that they have at their disposal. So yeah, and also educating about sexual orientation, right? And really normalizing that. Before I let you go, because I mentioned couples therapy, what are the questions that you want a couple like Louise and his partner to be asking of a couples therapist? Because I really want couples who have got a question like this to be working with a, a couples therapist who has the capacity to help them sit with these tangles and not every couples therapist does. So how can a couple like this ensure that they're working with the best provider? Yeah, really asking that the therapist is experienced in non-monogamous partnerships and dynamics, right? I'm not just tolerant of them, <laughs> right? But actually experience in supporting those kind of relationships and what happens in those relationships. And someone who's also, you know, really familiar and accepting of LGBTQ, right? So that that's not what someone's having to debate or educate as the, you know, client, but that the professional really embraces these different orientations and lifestyles. Oh my gosh, David and Jessica, our time flu. I can't believe we're already at the end. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. Tell us how we can find out more about the work that you both are doing and like what is the best way to get to know your work more deeply. They can find me online at restorativerelationship.com. That's my website and it's easy to get in touch with me via that. Yeah. And my website is jessicafern.com. Yeah. I think people can probably find a bunch of podcasts to learn more about our work and obviously to learn about our work through our books. We will put links to all of that in the show notes. And Poly Secure has been out for a few years and Poly Wise is brand new. I'm so glad that the two of you wrote it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book and an essential resource for really for, for couples of all, like no matter where an individual or couple falls in the spectrum, like there is so much to be learned from the work the two of you have done in this book and the questions that you are inviting and challenging us to ask. So there's just, it's such a rich resource. And I'm so grateful to the two of you for engaging together on this creative endeavor and creating something as wonderful as that book. Mm, thank you. And thank you for supporting it. Always, always. Awesome. Thank you. It's so great to meet you. Thank you to Luis from Brazil for sending us your thoughtful listener question. And thank you to David and Jessica for offering us your expansive perspective and showing us how intentional boundaries and thoughtful agreements help us ensure that our intimate partnerships are vehicles for growth, mutual support, and healing. You too walk the talk in all the best of ways. We have included links to Jessica and David's new book, Polywise, a deeper dive into navigating open relationships. And whether you are someone who practices monogamy or ethical non-monogamy, this book is a wonderful resource to help you deepen your understanding of relationship dynamics. Thank you for joining me today. And until next time, be well. Thank you for listening to our show. Our producer is Elizabeth Vogt. 
Our editors are Mary Chan and Katie Pagich of Organized Sound Productions. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Reimagining Love is executive produced by me, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.